we're ready to take a look at number two. The breaking strength of cables produced by a certain company has a mean of 1,875 pounds. The population standard deviation is 70 pounds. Engineers at the company claim they have found a modification to the manufacturing process that will increase the mean breaking strength of the cables. All right, so I'm just gonna highlight, I have a claim here that the mean breaking strength will increase using this new manufacturing process. So they're gonna to have to get some data to see if there's evidence of that, right? So to evaluate the claim, they take 32 cables that are randomly selected and they modify them. And the mean breaking strength is found to be 1900 pounds. Assume the population is normally distributed and that the standard deviation has not changed. So up top here, the population standard deviation was 70. So we'll assume that that is still the case. Using a 10% significance level, can we support the claim that the modification results in a mean breaking strength that is greater than 1,875 pounds? All right, so we'll start with our hypotheses. So the null hypothesis, H naught, the alternative hypothesis, H1. And we'll start with addressing the claim, the research hypothesis or the alternative hypothesis is that the population mean. So if they were to modify all their cables, they would like to test the claim that the mean breaking strength is greater than 1,875 pounds, making this a right tail test. The null hypothesis will be that the population mean remains 1,875 pounds. So as always in hypothesis testing, we start with assuming the null is true, and then we gather evidence to see if we find evidence against it. So that's why we're always drawing a picture of the null hypothesis. The mean is 1875. And then we'll go out and get some data to see what evidence it provides. So they go out and they take a look at 32 cables that they'll modify. And the sample mean for those is 1900 pounds. We're gonna assume the standard deviation is 70 pounds for the population. And alpha, our significance level, 10%. Or point one zero, And whether we do the traditional method or the p-value method, both of them require the test value. So that's why I do it next. So we could just jump right into the critical values first for our traditional method, but I just like to take care of the test value that corresponds to the x-bar value. So we're testing a claim about a population mean sigma is known. So if you're provided with sigma, we can use the z test to find the test value. So you don't have to do the calculation by hand. So we could find it using the formula, but we do have a graphing calculator here to help us out. So let's just go ahead and run our z test. So Sorry, went to the wrong place. So stat tests, Z test. And we're entering the statistics that are provided, but we'll start with our mu naught, 1875. And our sigma is 70, X bar 1900, sample size N 32. And the direction of the test, mu greater than my mu naught number. So we wanna make sure we do mu greater than the mu naught value. And then I'm gonna go calculate. And I'll round that test value, that z-score we see is our test value, and I'm gonna stick with two decimal places. 
so 2.02. So that's going to tell me where my x bar of 1900 is once I graph it. And we'd like to know if that result is statistically significant. So statistically significant means it is far enough above 1875 to make me believe that the mean actually is not 1875, it's actually something higher. So we just wanna see on our graph just how far right of 1875 is that value. All right, so there's two ways to determine that. One is called the traditional method of hypothesis testing. The other method is called the p-value method of hypothesis testing. In both cases, we're just trying to find a way to see if this value for our x bar is far enough to the right to be convincing that the mean is not 1875 truly for the population. All right, so let's go with traditional method first. All right, so for the traditional method, we find our critical values. It's a right tail test. So the area right of the critical value is alpha, which in this case is 0 0.10. And I'm gonna to continue to use inverse norm to find that z-score. So the critical value is a z-score and we don't inverse norm the area right, the inverse norm area left. So one minus the alpha here will be 0 0.90. So for the critical value Z, inverse norm, the area to its left. And it's positive 1.28. That answer does make sense because in a right tail test, the critical value should be on the right side. Z-scores, if that's zero, we should get a positive number. All right, so just approximating there, there's my critical value, 1.28. So any value for X bar that's in the shaded critical region is called a significant statistic. So these z-scores make up our critical region, and it's also called the rejection region. So you'll see it referred to as both of those things. And that area, it's a right tail test. So that area is to the right of the critical value. And so you may see this referred to as z subscript alpha, because alpha is to the right of it. So I'm not gonna use that notation um, moving forward. Mostly I'm just gonna write critical value so we can just refer to its name, but that is our graph. All right, so the traditional method of hypothesis testing says, where is your test value located? So our test value was 2.02. .02. So just ask two there. So my test value 2.02 .02 tells me that my X bar of 1900 is indeed in the shaded critical region. So I often forget to label the non-critical region because it, to me, is obvious. The critical region is shaded, so not critical is unshaded, but I'm going to label it here, not critical. All right, so my test value is falling in this shaded critical region. So we just say test value falls in the critical region, the rejection region. And that means it's so far to the right of 1875 that I'm going to reject that null hypothesis which said the mean was 1875. So I no longer believe that that's true based on this evidence because I got something so much higher. I now believe that the true population mean really is a higher value. All right, and anytime you reject the null hypothesis, 
So anytime you reject H not, it means you are supporting your claim that we wrote as our alternative hypothesis. Okay, that's traditional method of hypothesis testing. But there's a second way to say that 1900 is very far to the right, and that would be called the p-value method. So we always have an option of which method to use. We don't generally do both, um, unless you are taking statistics and we're learning both methods. But let's check out that same problem and what would the p-value method look like. All right, so for the p-value method, it's actually a little easier because the only thing we care about graphically is the test value. So 1875 is still the assumed mean when we start. And now we know that x bar of 1900 is there because we found its test value. So a p-value is the probability of getting something even further to the right than the test value. So the area to the right of the test value in a right tail test is called your p-value. And I can see visually here that this area is smaller than that alpha area. So my p-value visually I can see is smaller than my alpha area. So in the p-value approach, we compare the areas. Technically we say less than or equal to. It's generally never gonna be equal, but technically we, mathematically, we include the equal there. All right, and the rhyme is when that p-value area is low, we let the null go. In other words, we reject the null. All right, so I know all of that without even finding the actual numerical value of the p-value because I've drawn the pictures. So the p-value area is smaller than alpha, but let's go ahead and confirm it on our calculator. So let's go back to our tests, run our z-test again. And our calculator does the p-value method. So it does not do the traditional method, so up top here, we had to find the critical values ourselves using inverse norm, but our calculator does do the p-value method. It'll give you your p-value. So 0 0.0217, 0 0.0217. And since that's a probability value, so p-value stands for probability value, I like to write it as a percent. So this area is 2.17%. So I was correct visually that that area, 2.17%, is smaller than my alpha, which was 10%. So I'll write those values here. So 2.17%, comparing it to alpha, that is smaller. And technically less than or equal to um, not a big deal. We, you can just think less than is fine. And of course, when the p-value is low, lower than your alpha, you reject the null. You let the null go. Okay, so the way it works is that if your test value is in the critical region for your traditional method, that guarantees your p-value will be low because the 1900 is far to the right. And then in both cases, you better reach the same decision in either method because we're just doing the same problem two different ways. All right, and then they would both have the same conclusion. So when we reject the null, we support our claim. So based on a sample of 32, modified cables, We reject the null, so there is enough evidence to support the claim that, a modifi that the modification will increase the mean of all cables that are modified. 
So we're using the, this sample to say we think that this will be true for all modified cables. Okay, just giving you there then a picture of a right tail 